Good morning, Amago. So good to see you this morning. I'm gonna jump right in because I don't want to take too long. So let's let's jump right into it. Uh, a couple weeks ago, Rick ended in 1 Corinthians 15, and I'm gonna read the last few verses. Verse 56 says this: "The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory." through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 58 says this, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm, let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor is not in vain. Your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So what is this work of the Lord? We're being told in light of the fact that Jesus has won the victory, that we should give ourselves fully to the work of the Lord. What is this work of the Lord? What is God working toward? Well, Revelations 21, Jesus says that he is making all things new. And in 2 Corinthians, uh, the fifth chapter, we're told that God is reconciling the world to himself in Christ and has committed to us the message of reconciliation and that we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. God is making all things new. God is reconciling the world through Christ to himself and has made us his ambassadors. From Genesis to Revelation, we are all being told one story about one God who is on one mission to redeem one people. And the goal is to make us one family and to bring us into his kingdom. And that is the work of the Lord that we are invited to participate in. See, when we think about the, the already and the not yet, which is this reality that the kingdom of God is here, but it's not fully here. There are aspects of the kingdom of God that we can see, but there are other aspects that are yet to come to bear. A, a lot of times we tend to think and thank God for the already. Okay, the parts that we can see, the, the, the glimpses into the kingdom of God, we thank God for those. And then we tend to just accept the not yet. And just say, okay, that's not going to come until Jesus comes back. But I want to challenge that idea today. I believe that Jesus wants to bring some of that not yet into right now. Now, don't be looking at me funny. Hear me out. When, when Jesus teaches us to pray in Matthew 6, what does he say? Let's turn there together. Let's read there together. I'm going to be reading from the NIV and let's read just verses 9 and 10. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. Let's read together. Y'all ready? It says this. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And what I hear the Lord saying is this. My new creation is coming but it's also already here, and it's here because it's in you. New creation began when the Spirit raised Jesus from the grave, and now that same Spirit that raised Jesus from the grave is inside of you. So as ambassadors of my kingdom, I desire that you would give yourselves fully to my work, proclaiming the arrival of my kingdom and making my kingdom manifest in the earth. I have made you my new creation, and through you I continue to bring the reality of my new creation, my kingdom, to bear in the earth. The new creation has not fully come yet, but the new creation is in the not yet because we are here in the not yet, and we are the new creation. So what does that mean, y'all? It means that we get to participate. The work that God is doing, he has chosen to give us an opportunity to participate in it. Do we see ourselves that way? 
Like, do we recognize that we are the tools? God is on mission. He is accomplishing what he wants to accomplish, but he has chosen to use us as the tools to get the job done. Do we recognize that? I know we talk a lot about being disciples of Jesus, but do we recognize that that link to that reality, inextricably tied to that reality? Synonymous with that is the reality that we are also ambassadors of the kingdom of God. What is this kingdom? It's that reality where God rules and reigns, where things are the way that they should be. And Jesus wants you and I to participate in breaking that kingdom into the earth now. Amago, do we realize what an opportunity and even a great responsibility this is? The world needs us. And this is not a savior complex that puts us at the center. It's a savior confidence because it's not about us. It's about the savior, Jesus Christ, who desires to do the work through us. And one way that we make sure we don't get those wires crossed is we begin to pray the way that Jesus began to pray when he taught us to pray. Our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. We must first always acknowledge that God is God and we are not. So often what you will find is that we are often trying to make God more man-like than he actually is and make man more God-like than we actually are. The way this prayer opens up, it's a full acknowledgement that God is God and we are not. We are praying to God who, who, whose ways are not our ways, whose thoughts are far above our thoughts. This God who knows the beginning from the end, who is the Alpha and the Omega, this God who provides and who is himself love, this God who formed us from the dust of the earth and breathed into us and made us a living soul, our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. We recognize that you alone are worthy of worship. We recognize that you alone are worthy of praise. We recognize that we've given our worship and our praise to lesser gods, to little G gods. But now we come and say, our Father, which art in heaven, your name be praised. We must begin in a way that takes our minds and our hearts and our lives and orients them around God. To be a people who are giving ourselves fully to the work of the Lord, we must first humble ourselves and order our lives around Christ. And then we get to the next part. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. This is such a weighty and powerful statement. It was weighty and powerful in the days that Jesus was teaching it to the disciples, and it's still weighty and powerful today. So back then, Israel had been waiting for over a thousand years for this promised king and Messiah to come and save them from their sins, to rescue them from the oppressive rule of the, the Roman Empire, to make them a great and mighty nation, and to bring them uh, back into this everlasting joy and to fulfill the, the longings of their hearts. They were awaiting, awaiting this arrival of this king who would obliterate evil and rule justly, who would lift up hung down heads and mend and heal broken hearts. So to pray that God's kingdom would come and that his will would be done, to pray that in the midst of the Roman Empire, that's to pray for the destruction of the Roman government that currently ruled them. That kind of speak was dangerous, could, could even be considered treasonous. This was in a time when the Roman Empire would smash any nation or military that would try to rise against it or pose a threat to it. That's ultimately why they murdered Jesus, not just because he claimed to be God, but because as God, that meant that he was the promised king. 
And that king was coming to establish his kingdom and would rule and reign on his throne forever. But they were determined to have no king but Caesar. It was weighty then and it's, and it's weighty now because likewise, we, the people of God, have been waiting on Jesus to return for almost 2,000 years. And we know that scripture tells us that uh, of this new heaven and this new earth and we'll experience all of this glory and that we will be with God forever. How there will be no tears and no reason for tears because there won't even be any pain. There will be no sin, no evil, no corruption. We long for the day when we get to experience these things in the full. Yet when Jesus comes to give us some of that now, to bring his kingdom and have his kingdom come now, we struggle when it's time to hand over the crown. So we would all prefer this sort of brokered deal with Jesus where we appear to give him access to the stuff in our lives that we don't really mind him uh, taking away and we submit to his authority, but just in the areas where we agree with his truth. Why? Because we ultimately believe that we have a system that will work better than what God has in mind. We become content and complacent with the not yet and make our peace with things just being good enough. They may not be the way God wants them, but in this system, I've got the things that I can control. I've got my power. I've got my influence. I've got my privilege. And if Jesus coming to reign and rule and be who he fully is threatens that, I'm good. Now, I'm no way saying that Jesus is a genie in a bottle that we can just will to do whatever our heart desires. And I know sometimes we become placent with the not yet because we have been praying for a thing for a long time and we've not seen it change. I identify with you there. I, I've struggled for years to pray for certain things beyond what I could see because I've had experiences where those prayers felt like they they, they fell on a, the ears of a deaf God and, and I didn't get the results that I wanted so, so I can identify with you there. But there is a way to pray that is full of faith while still trusting that God is good and knows what is ultimately best for us. And here in this passage, God is telling us to pray in such a way that causes us to actually repent and confess that there is no other way that leads to life but God. This is one way we do the work of the Lord. We pray that his kingdom would come and that his will would be done in every area of our lives, in every, every sphere of influence that we have, in every city that we live in, country that we live in, state that we reside in. We walk around as people of the light and we gravitate to dark places so his kingdom would come and illuminate. We walk around with a Jesus filter on our eyes and we look for dead things and dead situations so that we can pray that his kingdom would come and bring life. God desires for us to pray beyond what we can see and not to be so proud to assume that we know what he desires to do. Let's think about it. How often do you pray for something that that you can't kind of already predict the outcome. Sometimes we start praying for, for a family member or a friend once we already heard they started going to church, you know. But what about that, that doozy of a, of, a, of a friend? What about that can't get right uncle, that cousin? That, do, we, do we pray? Will we, will we pray that, that the kingdom would come and God's will will be done in situations that seem hopeless and lifeless and dead, sex trafficking, and abuse, and racism. And I know that we look into all of these A's and, and we're looking for these leaders to come and make it all right, but are we praying that the kingdom, his kingdom, would come? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
It communicates our need for God and acknowledges that we know the only answer to the troubles and the evils of this world are found in him. The only true quenching of our thirst and complete satisfaction of our souls is found in him. That the only system and authority and government that will ever rule justly and rightly is found in him. That the only true equity and equality and reconciliation and unity and love and prosperity is going to be found in him. It is the reality where God rules and reigns rightly, justly, righteously, lovingly. The kingdom of God where things are the way they are supposed to be. Now I want to introduce this poem to you guys. Some of you may have heard it. Um, it goes like this. Uh, in West Philadelphia, born and raised, on a playground is where I spent most of my days. Chilling out, maxing, relaxing, all cool, and shooting some beat ball outside the school when a couple of guys who were up to no good started making trouble in my neighborhood. I got in one little fight and my mom got scared and said, you're moving with your auntie and uncle to Bel Air. I whistled for a cab and when it came near, the license plate said fresh and had dice in the mirror. If anything, I could say that this cab was rare, but I said, nah, forget it, yo homes to Bel Air. I pulled up to the house about seven or eight and I yelled to the cabbie, yo homes, smell you later. Look in my kingdom, I was finally there to sit on my throne as the Prince of Bel Air. I looked at my kingdom, I was finally there to sit on my throne as the Prince of Bel-Air. Now some of y'all recited that word for word. I see you. I mean, you know, not really, but. Some of y'all looking at me like, what is this boy talking about? Those are the lyrics from the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air uh, 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 sitcom starring Will Smith. See, Will grew up in the hood of West Philadelphia, but his mom wanted better for him, so she sent him to, the, to live with her sister's family in the prestigious suburban Bel Air. Will pulled up to their mansion and declared himself king, prince, but king, right? And the whole show, season after season, episode after episode, is about how he lived as if it was his house his world, as if he made the rules. Every episode depicted a young man who thought he knew best, but time and time again would end up in the principal's office or in heartbreak or on punishment or in jail or even in the hospital in some kind of predicament. And isn't that true of us? We trick ourselves or believes the lies from Satan that we actually have the answers to the good life or the best life, that we have the fixes for the evils of this world, that, that we've put faith in a candidate to bring about God's justice. We actually believe that Jesus would register for our political party. We act like we believe there would ever be a leader that will actually be able to bring the peace and shalom of God. We live as people of the kingdom of God, but we come up to the mansion like we the king. Will Smith never abided fully by the rules of that house. He never fully understood that Uncle Phil is going to find out the little things that you're doing. But Uncle Phil and the whole family wanted Will to be a part of the family. And the invitation was, if you would just submit to the way we do things here, it actually will lead to your flourishing. It actually will lead to your betterment. And that's the same way Jesus invites us. He invites us to trust him that we can pray this, your kingdom come, your will be done, because the way of his kingdom and his will 
is actually what's best for us. And though we've gotten comfortable in the way things are, and we've got our system set up to where we, you know, eat from it and we get a piece of the pie and, and we feel good about the situation, what God dreams for you is so much bigger, so much greater. What God dreams for this world, what God dreams for this city of Portland, he desires to do some things, but are we even paying attention and in tune and committed ourselves fully to the work of the Lord to be in a position to pray? God, first of all, we acknowledge you as God, you as King, you know best. We acknowledge that it's only in you that any of these things will be made right. And we come to you humbly and we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There will be a leader that will finally bring shalom, but it will be the, the God man, Jesus Christ. And that is who we put our faith in. That is who we build our lives on, Jesus. We look to Jesus, our way maker, our miracle worker, our promise keeper, light in the darkness, Jesus. The one whom it is so sweet to trust in, Jesus. Our creator, sustainer, and redeemer, Jesus. Our lily of the valley, bright and morning star, Jesus. Our strength, our vision, our confidence, Jesus. Our determination, our motivation, and our inspiration, Jesus. The one who suffered and bled and died to satisfy the negative balance on our account life, yours and mine, and then rose from the dead on the third day with all power in his hands. The one who ascended into heaven and sent us the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead and is now sitting at the right hand of the Father and at an appointed time will come back to fully establish his kingdom here on earth, a kingdom with no more war, no more othering, no more racism, no more murder, no more political debates, no more sexism, no more patriarchy, no more abuse, no more COVID, no more crying, no more pain. This Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. He is the only way into the kingdom of God and he invites you to trust in him and to join in as we give ourselves fully to his work, praying that his kingdom would come and that his will would be done now on earth as it is in heaven. Amago, let's, let's pray that prayer. And let's see what the Lord will do. Let's see what God desires to do in us and through us. Let's devote ourselves fully to the work of the Lord for his glory and our good. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you are a great God, a good God, a gracious God. I thank you that you have made a way for us to enter into your kingdom and not just to get in and, and, and chill and, and sit and, and wait for you to come back, but you said, hey, now that you're in my kingdom, help to work toward that kingdom breaking into the earth. God, we, we accept that invitation. God, I pray that we would continue to work in the earth, in our cities, in our communities, that the world might see glimpses of your kingdom today now. God, I pray that you would encourage our faith to be able to pray prayers that we haven't prayed in a long time, prayers beyond what we can see. God, I pray that we would recognize that we are the way you plan to execute your plan for this world. We are the tools that you have chosen to use, and there's no plan B. So God, I pray that we would not be distracted. 
I pray that we would not be so tethered to the ways of this world that we don't have time or the attention or the discipline to devote ourselves fully to your work. I pray that we would live lives that are a prophetic witness in this day and age. I pray that your kingdom would come and your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. I pray that you would encourage everyone listening under the sound of my voice. I pray that you would send your spirit to each of us and all of us and that we would feel your comfort, that we would feel your embrace. I pray that you would bring us back together in physical space soon. But I pray that we would ultimately work toward that your end goal and that even in this time of social distancing, that we would fully accomplish whatever you would have us to accomplish in this, in this season. God, you get the glory. You get the glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
As we close our time together this week, that is our prayer that our love would be shared with those around us, that you would use our lives to show your love to others around us. And Imago, I just want to close with Proverbs 3 from the message translation that says, trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure out everything on your own. Listen for God's voice in everything you do, everywhere you go. Amen. Hey, Imago Day community, this is Pastor Ben, missing all of you so much as we haven't been able to gather together in person for a while, um, but want to give you some updates and a couple of announcements on things that are happening around Imago Day community. Um, as the governor makes plans to reopen Oregon, we've been in com communication with her office, and Pastor Rick has written an update on what reopening is going to look like for us at Imago Day, along with a couple other just key important pieces of information. And so really want to encourage you um, to read that letter from him. Uh, you can go to blog.idcpdx.com uh, and read that. And that will re really give you a pretty good idea of where we're at right now um, and what it's going to look like uh, moving forward. Um, as we've learned that it's going to be quite a while longer until we're able to gather um, as a larger gathering, potentially end of the summer, even um, into the fall, past September, um, we're going to continue with our online service. And so we would love to get your feedback. Uh, we have a survey that's online. Uh, many of you have heard about that in the last couple of weeks, but it's going to be open until Tuesday. If you haven't filled out that survey, um, it's really short. It took you a minute to fill it out. Um, but it does really give us some really valuable information on how your experience has been and how we can better serve you as we strategize moving forward. And so please go on our website um, and fill out that survey. Just It's, it's just 10, 11 questions, um, but will really help us think through how we can better walk with you in this season. And so please do that. Um, we're also going to be shifting our focus um, to try to really open up small groups. Um, and we're going to have virtual small groups. Um, that, that are going to be starting. If you, some of you are already in a community group and you're already gathering, but we want to start some of those virtual community groups um, for those of you that have not been connected. Um, obviously, many of us, we watch the service and we're having our services um, online in our homes on Sundays, um, but it's really important for us as the people of God and as a, a Mogadish community to be connected relationally with each other. And so we're going to start some of these virtual groups. If you're not currently in a community group but would like to get into one of these groups, um, there's an interest um, form online on Imago Day's website um, where you can feel, hey, I would love to get into one of those community groups, and then we'll help place you uh, in a group that, that is going to gather and meet. Um, if you're interested in possibly hosting one of those groups, we need people who would be willing to step in and say, hey, I could host a conversation online with some other people in Imago. would love to get to know other Imago Day people anyway. Um, so let us know. We have a staff that's ready to train you and equip you on how to run those groups. Um, and would love to have you involved in that. Hopefully, as the governor slowly reopens Oregon, uh, we'll be able to take those from being virtual groups to potentially meeting in person, uh, where we're able to gather and break bread together, worship together, pray together, and that's really what we long to do is just to keep you connected. Um, so you can sign up for that online, um, go to our website, um, and fill out that interest form. That would be really helpful for us. Uh, we really miss you as a staff. We pray for you weekly um, and talk about you all the time. Uh, we really look forward to the possibility of when we can all gather again um, as we are the people of God on mission in the city of Portland right now. Um, and we will continue to be that. And so we love you um, and look forward to hopefully seeing you soon.